great, so we'll get started. I'm so glad that uh, so many of you are here this evening uh, for the uh, event. Uh, my name's Quinton Main. I'm an assistant professor here at the Kennedy School, and I sit over in the Ash Center, and I work on urban politics, so I'm very happy to uh, be hosting this evening's uh, event. So this evening's event is actually part of a series of events uh, hosted by uh, the Ash Centre, which is part of the Ash Centre's Challenges to Democracy series, which is in honour of the Ash Centre's 10th um, anniversary. And it's really a series of public dialogue uh, events. And within that, we have a subset of, of events that have been going for the past year and will be going over the next couple of years. It will be focused on cities and urban spaces. And really what we're interested in looking at is the ways in which cities can help democracy be realized in the United States, um, or the challenges posed at the level of cities to the realization um, of democracy. So um, for this evening, uh, we're, we're, we're going to be thinking about uh, those challenges to democracy at the urban level um, through two documentary films and engagement with the makers of those films. Um, so this evening we have um, Andrew Padilla, and King Williams, and I just want to introduce them uh, briefly, as well as Carolyn uh, Crockett, who will be uh, uh, responding to the clips and Andrew and King's remarks about their uh, documentaries. So Andrew is a filmmaker, an independent journalist and educator, and he was born and raised in El Barrio, uh, in New York City. Andrew's family immigrated to New York from Puerto Rico, and growing up in an immigrant family has deeply uh, informed his work, as you'll see from the documentary, which focuses on the ability and rights of communities to shape, as he says, their own fates. Uh, since premiering his film, El Barrio Tours, Gentrification in East Harlem, at the San Diego Latino Film Festival in 2012, he's been screening and holding dialogues on gentrification and displacement and social inclusion uh, related to the documentary across New York. And in the fall of 2013, he raised uh, $12,000 through crowdsourced uh, funding from 240 people from all over the world to take the film nationwide. Um, and on the heels of a barrio tours, Andrew is making a new film on gentrification in, uh, and displacement in the US more generally. And you'll be uh, hopefully happy to know that there's a link to the crowdsourced funding mechanism for that from our, uh, our uh, uh, Ash Center events page. Uh, King Williams is a filmmaker based in both New York City um, and Atlanta. In 2011-2012, uh, King interned with director Spike Lee, and he's currently working on three separate uh, film projects. Um, his film debut, uh, The Atlanta Way, uh, clips from which we'll be viewing this evening, uh, is due to be released uh, next spring, so you've got your sneak peek this evening. He also has a film blog, Free Film University, and a debut novel to be released in the fall of 2015. Um, King has a passion for community engagement and splits his time to support two nonprofits in Atlanta, this sneaker ball and virtuous careers. So finally, uh, Dr. Carolyn Crockett, uh, who will be responding to the clips and what uh, Andrew and King have to say, was recently appointed as Director of Economic Policy and Research at the city of Boston. Carolyn holds a PhD in American Studies uh, from Yale and is fundamentally interested in questions of the relationship between education, economic development, and urban revitalization. Her current research focuses on large-scale land use changes in 20th century America um, and, example, and examines the social and geographic implications of structural poverty. Uh, Carolyn's dissertation, entitled People Before Highways, Reconsidering Routes to and from the Boston Anti-Highway Movement, investigates a 1960s era grassroots movement to halt urban extension of the interstate highway system. Um, prior to graduate school, Carolyn co-funded multicultural youth tour of what's now My Town, which actually was an award-winning, uh, is an award-winning educational nonprofit organization. Uh, and as a Boston organization, My Town hired public high school students to research their local and family histories to produce youth-led walking tours uh, for sale to uh, public audiences. Um, before I turn over to um, Andrew King and Carolyn, I just wanted to say a few words maybe to motivate um, the clips that we'll be watching as well as what Andrew and King and Carolyn have to say. 
Um, quite often you hear the city being compared to a palimpsest, you know, this ancient manuscript where pages are layered on top of pages when the supply of paper is in short supply. And we sort of think about cities in, in oftentimes in those terms that there's that a city is both a process of layering, but also a process of novelty, of new communities coming in and replacing old communities. And somehow that that is part of the natural cycle of city life and urban life, that communities come and go, and there's displacement and there's layering. So what we're hopefully going to be thinking about this evening is the ways in which that layering occurs and the ways in which that displacement occurs and how we want to normatively think about patterns of layering and displacement, and how we might want to evaluate it and judge it positively and negatively. But more importantly, we also want to think about the role that local politics and city government and state and federal agencies play in those processes of layering and displacement, and whether the role that cities are playing and local government is playing is a good role, whether it's actively taking a role um, in facilitating the layering and displacement in a good or bad way and how it's helping communities negotiate the process of layering um, and displacement. So just some questions maybe that I'll pose to you that you might want to keep in mind while you're uh, watching the clips and hearing Andrew King and Carolyn uh, speak are the following. What sort of rights do we as individuals, families and communities owe each other and to those individuals, families, and communities in space. What rights do spaces have and communities in space have? And do people have rights to space as well as rights that inhere in themselves as individuals, families, and uh, communities? We also want to think about the pros and cons of socioeconomic and racial and ethnic homogeneity or diversity in our communities. What positive role does more or less homogeneity or more or less heterogeneity play in helping communities resist or react to or respond to processes of layering and displacement? Um, and what do we owe each other um, from different spaces within the city, from rich to poor or from white to non-white? And really fundamentally, what is it that democracy is doing or not in any of these processes? Are these processes happening in spite of democracy, because of democracy? What role are we as citizens in our communities through our elected representatives playing to navigate and control these processes of layering and displacement? And what role does social inclusion play or the role of the city or state or federal governments in providing uh, spaces or housing or other vehicles in order to uh, facilitate social inclusion in a city that's layering and where displacement is occurring. Um, so with that said, I'd like to hand it over. I'm not too sure, do we have the sequencing worked out? In, in terms of the clips? So can you read up first? Yeah, so I'll hand, hand it over to King and he'll be showing some clips and telling you about his documentary. <laughs> Um, hey, how's it going, everybody tonight? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, what we're going to be talking about tonight, as you guys already know, as Quentin has already mentioned before, is this world of displacement, and the world of cities, and the world of gentrification, and what our cities are going to be looking like going forward. Tonight, I'm going to do something a little different um, in the sense that I'm going to be talking to you about the city that I know and love, which is my hometown of Atlanta, Georgia. What we're going to be doing tonight is looking at my particular film, which is The Atlanta Way, which is a documentary on gentrification. So we're going to walk through a lot of things that are about our film that you guys may or may not be able to apply here in Boston or where you guys are from as well. And so, you know, also, just to throw this out there, I like to use my phone. So if you guys see me reaching on my phone, I'm not on Instagram. I'm just making sure that we're hitting all the points that we want to hit tonight. And without further ado, we can start from here. as you guys may know, this guy is handsome guy, that's who I am. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
So as you guys can see, this is me. I just want to, you guys to get a kind of feel for me. I understand who I am. King Williams, I am, again, a student of Georgia State University. But honestly, my name is Jared. And I want to kind of bring that up because my parents named me that way for a specific reason. For that, those of you who don't know what Jared means, it comes from two particular uh, phrases. One, Jared, uh, from the Germanic sense, which means spear, which means to be brave. The other, in Hebrew, which, which means he sh who should rule. And I want you guys, as we're talking tonight, to focus on the issue of rulership. Who rules what? What constitute rule? And also, who gets to make the rules? So, as we look at the word gentrification, the word actually comes from the French word, which actually predates that, which dates back to Roman Britain, which refers to gentry, as you guys can see behind me. And for those guys who don't know what the gentry is, essentially it's the people who actually control and run and essentially fuel France at that particular point in time. And more specifically, I wanted you guys to have a definition so you guys can also see just by definition what it means. And so in telling the story of Atlanta, it was really important for myself and the story that I wanted to tell alongside my friends at Georgia State University is that when we speak about gentrification, we're coming from a very specific place. In terms of what happened in Atlanta, Atlanta is a microcosm for gentrification efforts going on in other cities across the country, particularly Chicago, particularly New Orleans. When the gentry, in this case of Atlanta being the Atlanta Housing Authority and the city government themselves, would be the people who actually would set aside the rules and the policies and the procedures that would essentially change our city for better, for worse, and for always with regards to the 1996 Olympics. And again, focusing on rule, focusing on gentry, looking at who actually decided and who made the decisions. First, I want you guys to understand the person who actually brought the term gentrification to our lexicon as collectively was in 1964 by this wonderful woman named Ruth Glass. What she was doing, she was exploring what was happening in her particular neighborhoods in London, England. She used the word gentry and she added the particular term to lexicon because that was the best way that she could describe it. And that brings us to present day what our story is about, which is the Atlanta Way. <laughs> That's for particularly Booker T. Washington, the Atlanta Compromise. This predates the actual phrase, the Atlanta Way by about 10 or 15 years. The Atlanta way, for you guys who don't know, it actually is a phrase that's used in Atlanta. It refers to two, particularly the black and white elite of Atlanta, who at pre-turn of the century, going all the way until the early days of Daddy King, would essentially run the city. The black and white business elites, the black and white political elites, in order to keep Atlanta in terms of representing it, they wanted to keep it whole, they wanted to keep it poor, they wanted it to not be Birmingham and other cities in the South. So these particular coalitions govern each other through segregation. So henceforth, that's why the term is called the Atlanta Way, and it's based in what Booker T. Washington and what you guys heard earlier in the Atlanta Compromise. Also with that said, this also will play out with regards to our public housing in the future. When the first Techwood project, being Techwood Homes, opened in Atlanta, it was made sure that these particular projects were segregated. Both the first projects who actually opened in the United States, not necessarily breaking ground, was Techwood Homes, and that opened in 1935. The first public housing project for African Americans University homes opened in 1941. Again, these are two things by both parties of the gentry who set aside their economic policy with regards to what they want to do with the city of Atlanta. Always separate, always equal, but always separate. And so, essentially what made me want to decide to do this story was, I grew up in Atlanta. I grew up in East Atlanta specifically, Decatur specifically for you guys who don't know. To this day, I guess you guys see somebody in the crowd. <laughs> and for those of you guys who don't know, it's majority black. Um, again, Atlanta's a racialized city, and once I got to school at Georgia State, as you guys can see behind me, these were several students who decided to work with me on a particular idea, and we thought it was a great question to ask, which is where did the people go? The people being the first people of Techwood Homes in East Lake Meadows once those public housing projects were removed for the 96 Olympics. I remember asking my mother and my father what happened to those people, and no one could really give me an answer. And to put it in how significant that was is, 10% of all people prior to the 1996 would live in Atlanta Housing Authority public housing. If you take 10% of anything, we'll take 10% of New York City. At 10% of New York City, you're talking 820,000 people. That's pretty significant. And what changed this is because this particular project that you guys are looking at right here, which was East Lake Meadows, which was the catalyst, 
the first project to go down in lieu of the 1996 Olympics. This was a really groundbreaking and innovative measure in the sense that before this point in time, people had public housing and everyone thought that public housing had to be substandard. And also this contradicts the image of Atlanta that we see today, which is essentially, you know, highlighted black middle class, black upper class, and all these things are going on. Essentially, you have two dynamics within Atlanta itself. You have the dynamic of the black poorer class as well as the dynamic of the black upper class, and they both live within the same city. East Lake Meadows, for a lot of people, Techwood Homes, Perry Homes, and the image that was portrayed wasn't necessarily one image that I believe was true. In addition to doing that, the other students at Georgia State itself felt the same way. They think because we live in the project that we are the project. We're human beings, first and foremost, and we're residents who want to have something. We're not lazy like they, they say we are. We pay rent. Some of us get lax behind because they lost a job or something like that. But then if you don't give a person an opportunity to do anything, then you get what you give out, nothing. It's not about right and wrong, it's about equality. And it's about the quality of the residents. And I just feel like if you're gonna, if you're gonna tear down a property and displace people, they should have the opportunity to speak out. Not their First Amendment snatched away from them, but to be able to speak out, not to be intimidated and afraid to speak out so that they don't come to meetings to know what's going on in, with their community. But this has been done, and it's like the Gestapo coming in. We're in America. At least I thought we were. The closing of the center the changing of the locks, and then the scare tactics. We're gonna evict you. Let me say this to you. They, residents raise their hand and ask questions. Oh, well, we'll come back and we'll answer that the next time, but we'll give it to you in writing and it never comes. Or they'll say, uh, one, one lady asked, uh, well, if you're gonna get, give us vouchers like that and reveal, she says, can we come move back in? And he told her, he didn't have an answer. Then he said that if you move out, no, what did he say? If they don't want to move, what'll happen? He said, we'll evict you. It's just like when they write the plan. They write the plan, they bring the plan. So it's no consultation because our ideas go to the back of the plan, which means you don't have a plan for us to consultate on. It's your plan. And that particular clip that was of Diane Wright. And Diane Wright was a resident leader of Hollywood Courts. Hollywood Courts is one of the last remaining public housing projects that we worked on within the film. Which brings us to one of the first and important facts about Atlanta, which is this is the first film that analyzed the gentrification of an entire city. Now, this is alongside my colleague here, Mr. Andrew, who's working on one as well in New York City, so it's great to actually work with someone who's essentially working on the series of first. In regards to Atlanta, the other thing that I'd like you guys to know is that for us, Atlanta's the first city in U.S. and world history to not only open public housing, but it's also the first city to close all of its public housing. Despite what people may think, essentially the Atlanta project and the Atlanta model fail. Now, the new income model is mixed income communities, and because of that, Atlanta is seen as the center of rebuilding and new ideas with regard to public housing. Now, our third fact is that because of mixed income communities, you can see this in new places like New Orleans, as well as the Caprini Green and Chicago housing authorities elimination of all their public housing projects. The reason being is because the Atlanta public housing project concept of mixed income communities and diversified communities have worked. The controversy in a sense comes from who gets to come back to the projects as well as who gets to receive vouchers and subsidies for these particular things. The reason why most people are upset and the reason why you saw Diane Wright is because most residents when they get an opportunity to come back, if they do get an opportunity to come back, it's not 100% of the residents prior. So in most public housing projects, if 100% of the units went down, only 20% were back. So in bringing back only 20% of the residents, yes, you have addressed the issue of low income communities, but at the same point in time, there are 80% of residents now who had subsidies, who had vouchers, who had a place to live, albeit it may not be the best place, but now you have a system in which, now you see in Chicago, what happens when you disperse people who have no job, no income, no source of income for a long period of time. But the thing that makes Atlanta different, in a sense, from other places like Chicago is that it's always been an outlier. It's been north of the south and south of the north, as it's been said by W.E.B. Dubois. 
But at the same point in time, it's one of the few cities, at least that once it gentrified, it managed to make money. It managed to make a profit. Most places when they do tear down public housing, they don't necessarily generate a profit. With the Atlanta Housing Authority model, once projects are torn down and once things are destroyed, you are able to sell and renovate the land. So one of the things we wanted to address in the film is, is the Atlanta Housing Authority essentially for the people? Or is the Atlanta Housing Authority essentially a government subsidized real estate agency? And the reason being it is derived from the 96 Olympics, as you guys can see the fountain before. But the 96 Olympics is the last financially solvent Olympics in human history at this point in time. And I know you guys, Boston, may or may not be looking at the Olympics in 2024. I'm going to say it now. You should really think about this. <laughs> The reason being is because, one, once public housing projects went down, the Atlanta Housing Authority as well as the city government, you were able to tax, sell, and annex the land that you were already there before. In addition to that, in addition to selling the land, more and more development comes in as we know with gentrification and how it works and how things step up. But the thing that made Atlanta very different is the sense that people kept coming after the Olympics. Now with Boston, if you guys were to accept the Olympics, will that necessarily bring in new growth? And for most other cities, it doesn't. If you guys could see what's going to happen just with Rio after the World Cup, if you guys could see what happened with London with the $50 billion that they spent, these are going to be things that are going to be raised out of tax dollars, things that are going to affect you guys here in Boston directly and immediately. In addition, as you guys can also know from our Braves, Atlanta Braves team with their debacle going to Cobb County, the reason why that even happened is because on the book still to this day, any and all public funds can be used for uh, gain if it used the Olympic model of <coughs> governance, which is essentially the Atlanta Braves thought that, hey, well, since it, there's a, a, a law in the books that says if we tax motels and we collect taxes for motels and events, we should be able to use that money to effectively build new stadiums and build new arenas, things that bring in income. Now, it is a good idea in theory, but unfortunately, it doesn't really happen. And so that brings us to one problem that we've had with the Atlanta Way going forward, and even at the beginning, which is that most people don't like that idea. Most people don't like the idea of people essentially making the film about gentrification, a film that tries to analyze both cause and effect. For us, we interviewed the residents, as you guys can see, of Diane Wright. We interviewed the developers. We interviewed those who worked with Atlanta Housing Authority because we wanted one consistent answer. And unfortunately, we couldn't get one. Because when you talk about gentrification, at the end of the day, it's a very personal in a very effective way to get someone's true emotion about what they think about life. In the sense that when we interview most of the residents in public housing, they weren't necessarily against not moving out of public housing. What they were against is necessarily breaking up their homes, breaking up their families, breaking up their social structures without any regard to what they're going to be doing. So as you saw, Diane Wright said the plan, the plan that she's referring to, the Atlanta Housing Authority's plan at that particular time, to move and renovate all of the people in Hollywood Courts and to hopefully open that up for new development. And for the record, Hollywood Courts still sits vacant to this day. So that was five years ago. And for most of the developmental projects in Atlanta that have been essentially raised, only about a third of them have actually been developed on. So now you have two thirds of people who could have been still in public income housing or low income housing who aren't there. So that's one of the problems that we've had with our film in response to people who don't necessarily want to see that happen again. And one of the biggest misnomers is that our southern county, which is Clayton County, for you guys who don't know, that could be the equivalent of Roxbury, or if you guys are from New York, the South Bronx, which is the poorest county of our five major counties, the overall response was that because public housing has ended in Atlanta, everyone went south. And within the reality, the numbers don't point to that, but it becomes a convenient scapegoat. That can be scapegoat now refers to the city needed to more gentrify even Clayton County because at this point in time, if there is an issue of crime, you're pushing out more and more people. Now, this isn't necessarily done with the Atlanta Housing Authority, but what we're seeing is gentrification as a mechanism for urban development and essentially resegregation of Atlanta. The Atlanta that the people who worked in the Atlanta Compromise and Booker T. Washington worked so hard to at least make better for both the poor of both blacks and whites. So. For the last few years, you know, I've had a chance to really understand it, understand what that means to really be a gentrifier and what it means to work as someone who is being gentrified. And they have one commonality in the sense that for both parties, the idea of subjugation is something that neither one wants. The gentrified doesn't want to push somebody out of their home. The person who is gentrified in the neighborhood wants to make money, but they don't necessarily want to hurt families. The person who is being gentrified wants the same amenities. The same amenities that other people are getting from middle class, but they don't want to necessarily have to lose their homes, lose their property, lose their low-income jobs because they can't afford to live there. 
And since we're here at Harvard talking about cities, the one thing I noticed with Atlanta and now living in New York is, is the future of cities being unaffordable. Because at least in Atlanta, the over stark and overwhelming reality is that it's becoming vastly affordable for even middle income persons. In New York City, I know Andrew as well can state that it's hard to live in New York, and I live in New York. So if the future of cities is to gentrify, and the future of cities is to redevelop, are we re redeveloping ourselves out of our own cities? And at what point in time are we looking at a way for our city to be essentially one whole city for every group of people? And right now, with the Atlanta, we've seen the model that works for Atlanta, which is mixed income communities, which essentially does work, but you don't get 100% participation. So if our cities are going to work, will they be working as cities with only 20% of its public housing, or will it be cities with only 10% of its financially poor, or will it only be cities with only 10% of its women? The overwhelming answer right now, the way cities are going, is that we're keeping things separate because we need tax dollars. And at the end of the day, tax dollars trumps human interest. And so for us shooting the film, this is one thing that we really hope that people get a chance to connect to. And particularly, I hope you guys here at Harvard think about it as you guys are going forward with how you develop and how you lead the next generation of people as well as the next cities, as well as the next governments and government plans. And so for us in Atlanta, our story is pretty much set in stone at this point. There are people who are trying to change it, and I'm glad that we actually now will have a better public transit system as of last three weeks ago. And so that's a small step forward. But essentially, you guys in Boston have the opportunity to not be where Atlanta is. You guys may or may not get the Olympics. It is a strong possibility that you do. You guys may or may not be gentrifying. Oh, well, I'm trying. You know, it's hard. I gotta, you know, do better. So, but going forward, it's the idea of where are we as cities? Where are we as people? And the city that I want to live in is a city that's vastly affordable. The place I want to live in is the place that where I can live in a middle income area be a middle income, but also know people who are working class, who are working poor, who all have the same ideas and the same goals and aspirations. We may not necessarily have the same financial standings, but at least we have the same social and resource standings that comes with being a resident of the city. And because of that, I'm really hoping and I'm really thankful that Harvard has brought myself here today with the panelists that you guys here before me, because they're gonna speak on what it takes and what it means for their particular city, as well as what it means going forward. And I thank you guys for having me today. This is very important to everyone here. And on behalf of that, we can take a pause for a bit. And I will open up for my fellow guests. Oh, damn. <laughs> no, man. Uh, hearing, hearing King speak is. Um, I'm really glad that he began with what gentrification is. Um, I'm really glad. I'm glad that you, 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 you brought it back like further. Gentrification isn't a brand new phenomenon. Um, I didn't know what gentrification was growing up. I had I never heard of the word. I'd say maybe even six years ago, I'd never heard the word gentrification uh, before. If I heard, I certainly know what it meant. But I, I did remember when I was a kid. I'm born and raised in East Harlem. Uh, my parents, they, uh, my family came from Puerto Rico uh, in the 50s and 60s during Operation Bootstrap. It's essentially neoliberalism being tested on Puerto Rico before it came here. Uh, and so Puerto Rico was in an interesting point in the 50s, well, in the 40s leading up into the 50s. Puerto Rico, right, coming from being a colony under Spain, and then in 1898 becoming a colony of the United States. Commonwealth, excuse me. Which does not translate into Spanish. On all the garbage trucks in Puerto Rico, it says Estado Libre Asociado, Free Associated State, which is a different type of classification, which is a nice way of saying it's bullshit. Uh, so anyways, um, Puerto Rico was in an interesting place, right? They, they, they were, there were two large factions. There was a faction that wanted independence, and there was a faction that wanted to be a bit closer. And actually, the independence faction was pretty strong, but what broke was labor, right? Labor, you can't have a movement if you don't have labor. And labor ended up breaking to get close to the United States. And so Puerto Rico made a different choice. Instead of spending the time on developing their own economy, they did what they could to incentivize others to come in and bring an economy in or, or develop. You know, what tax breaks or incentives can we give to the outside, to American corporations or, 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 or businesses on the outside, right? How can we bring them in? How can we help them 
help us, essentially. Um, so my parents came in that because in that process, um, that economic plan, part of that economic plan uh, was tremendous displacement in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico lost over a million people in that time. There are currently more Puerto Ricans living outside of the island today than people who actually reside. I think it's like four point something and three point something, right? So that was, you know, later on, government officials were asked, like, wow, did you know all these people were going to be displaced? Did you have any idea? And they're like, oh, we didn't know. <laughs> Maybe they didn't. But it was conditioned. There wasn't enough. By that model, there was simply not enough. That was always the mantra. Puerto Rico can't sustain itself. It wouldn't be able to do it alone. There's just too many people. Well, through that model, that was the case. And um, so my parents came. And that was really a group of people who just could not find work. Uh, and that's, that's how my family ended up here. And I'm so glad, and I've been following King's work for a bit because um, his work focuses on public housing. And the only way in which my story would have been possible, um, the only way that it is possible, excuse me, is public housing. All of my family has been through public housing, right? My grandparents, when they came here, that was the first place that they went uh, after tenement slums, right? Um, they found an opportunity in public housing. And it's important to remember, this idea that we have of public housing, that's not what it was. Like, in fact, public housing was like, take, I remember my grandmother saying it was kind of like she moved up a class, right? Because you're talking about going from tenement slums with like rats and, and shared bathrooms, and now you have your own bathroom, you have water, you have electric, you have an elevator. This was, this was a big thing. For a few years, there was, there was funding. Right? There was an actual commitment for a few years. Um, and even though that commitment was yanked, um, which explains, in my mind, why things went so badly, um, right? It's like you have a relationship and you don't commit to it, right? It's like, I'm with this, I'm with this woman, and uh, I'm not going to call her, though, right? I'm with her, but I'm not going to spend time with her, right? We're going to go out to eat, but she better pick up the check. You know, or then even beyond that, I'm actually going to invest my time and energies in another woman, right? That wouldn't work for a relationship, nor does that level of thinking work for public housing, and it didn't, uh, so it failed. But I always like to mention, like, okay, it failed. Why did it fail? It's another thing that I love about about King's work. He's asking, he's asking us to ask not just you know what is happening, but why is happening, who's benefiting through these processes, and. Um, Again, yeah, I, didn't, I didn't understand any of those conversations when I was younger. I just remember being 15, and uh, who's ever taken the sixth train in Manhattan? All right, cool. Y'all ever uh, taken it above 96th Street? Yeah? I, did you ever hear the announcement? I remember I was like 15, and it was, it was weird. I was on the train, and it was like, this is 96th Street. This is the last stop on this train for all Caucasians. The next stop is 103rd Street. Did y'all ever hear that? It was, like, it was crazy. Like clockwork, at 96th Street, all the white people got off the train. I was 15. I didn't know about any of the, I, if I was here and I was 15, I would, I would be jumping all over the place. I wouldn't even be able to sit still. Like, who was this guy up here talking about bullshit? Um, and I was, I was a kid that would have actually said that out loud. Um, but I didn't know why that was, I just knew that it was. And then I remember a couple years passed, right? And, and me and my friends, we would bet, right? And it's important, right? We, we, we bet who's gonna get off the train. And it's weird that at 15, we knew we could actually today, without knowing any of these people, we'd know who was getting off at what stop. Well, we must be magicians. <laughs> but beyond that, I'll never forget that it began to change, and we, we didn't understand that either. Right? We began to see that people were passing those borders. These, these bo we'd known them to be, we didn't know why they were borders, but we knew they were borders. There was one time this guy he fell asleep on 125th Street on the train. Mm -hmm. Like he fell asleep, he was, he was a white guy, he fell asleep at 86 and he woke up at 125th and he was petrified. He was banging, banging on the door to get out. I never saw my neighborhood like that. Like I never had that level of fear in my neighborhood, ever, ever. Things were bad at times, but I never once was that scared to be in my neighborhood. Because it was my neighborhood, it was my community. And so, um, 
Anyways, I, I wanted to understand why these changes were occurring, and so I began the process of trying to figure it out. And so a lot of that was um, research and talking with elders, and I, after years of formally researching, I decided, you know what, I actually want to share some of what I've learned and learn from others, because I know we can't be the only ones who are dealing with um, this, because it wasn't just that new people are coming in, right? It's, it's not just that. It's that our people were leaving. And... In terms of what it is a gentrifier, that was such an, I mean, the, to us, it was a gentrifier seemingly is someone who wants to change the neighborhood and their interests, right? I just want to say that that's how I, I don't think that if you're a new resident, you're inherently a bad person. Okay? If I move to the South Bronx right now because I can't afford East Harlem, I don't want someone to think I'm an inherently bad person for that. However, um, I think it's about intention and, uh, and what you do with your privilege. So I just wanted to mention that. That being said, these are some residents that I, that, I, that I became kind of close to in my neighborhood, and they were dealing with displacement. They're right next to where the East Harlem explosion was. Have you ever heard of that? Does anyone know what that is? Uh, in East Harlem, uh, we have a pretty old housing stock, and there was an explosion that occurred in East Harlem in March. And I originally thought it was this building. It isn't. Um, but it's just because they had so many problems with their landlord, and they actually had an explosion shortly after this clip. Um, so I'm going to play a short clip of this for you, and I just want you to um, hear their voices and, and um, just kind of understand a bit of what, is, what has been occurring so far um, in my community. Me and my wife, Vanessa, we moved to the neighborhood a year and a half ago, and I, I love everything about this neighborhood. It's so much better than the last one. But compared to the last one, we had a super in our building. And our building was a uh, 18th century, uh, 1800s tenement building. And if that could have a super, there's no reason why a large building like this one shouldn't. And with the amount of rent, especially that I'm paying, I know that everyone has their own <coughs> amounts that they're paying, I believe that we need a super. We, we deserve a super. I, got, I mean, what, what else she's trying to get me out of here because of rent control, look at my kitchen. I have to live with everything out of the cabinets because of the mildew. And I have to live like a pig because I can't use my cabinets. Everything is out. So she took me to court because I have too much stuff in my apartment. She gave me this new, but see it's all full of mildew? My asthma is so bad, okay, that I can't even breathe sometimes. And I have all these appointments trying to keep a roof over my head. I mean, your husband doesn't die every year. I was with my husband 28 years, you know? Now, all of a sudden, I'm trying to put my life back together, and this woman's trying to kick me out. Where am I going to go? I'm trying to keep the little that I have. Landlord has to realize that in the early 80s and late 80s, um, this tenants association kept this building free of drugs. Yes. Right. We would have a tenant control. Yes. I live on the top floor near the roof, and I would come home from work, and there would be multitudes of people by the roof landing, smoking crack, getting high. And it was us that kept the building safe for us and clean for the landlord. Legally, we're entitled to um, live here, whether it be rent control, rent stabilization, because we've been here many years. You pay, we all pay our rent on time, they can't say anything about that. So if you expect service in return, it's not asking too much. This is my husband, John Cuba. He's, he's the father of Boogaloo. He has three gold records. He's played all over the world. He was the first Latino to make English words to Spanish music so that the Americans could understand it. Okay? Yeah. He was the first true crossover. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hawaii. Uh, they called me one time at my job and offered me $2,000 to move out. $2,000. And it was, it was the landlord himself called me and said, yes, he called and he said, uh, you've been living here long enough, isn't it time to move? So he said, I said, then what are you offering? He said, $2,000. I said, you forgot quite a few zeros. <laughs> I'm so glad my husband's not here to see this. Okay, I'm so glad he's not here. But he would be proud that I need some stand, you know, keeping to my guns. I didn't run. As long as we stay together. I'm not running nowhere. This is all I have. This is my memories. 28 years living in here with him, you know? 
No, I'm gonna fight to whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, I'm gonna do. There's a certain economic. Ah, sorry. Um, so I, I'm. I, I will um, tell you that is Joe Cuba's wife. I did not know. At first, I thought it was just some Latina that loves Joe Cuba. There are a lot of them. Um, he's a big dude. Um, so for a while, one on one. Huh? Oh, could you get to? Thank you so much. Uh, so for a while, that was the first clip that would actually come out when you would search 101 East 116th Street. So it was really good uh, because if someone is looking for this, right? That's I know this story because I spoke with them. I promise. You come in from some somewhere outside the community, just looking for an affordable place to live. You're not going to know that that necessarily is happening, right? And so I think it actually began, I saw that the, the, the numbers, the, the, the rent numbers began to come down a little bit because when you would search that listing, 101 East 116th Street, what would you get? This video of these old ladies getting kicked down, you know, it's sad, man, that's messed up. So, after a bit, the property manager decided to do their own video <laughs> and name it the same thing. Oh, wow. We come up uh, in right next to each other now on Google, and this is honestly one of my favorite videos. Uh, and I'm really happy to share it with you. <laughs> <laughs> the spaces are really large, and people are really happy with it. Location's great. It's very close to the park. The greatest park of all. It is. No! <laughs> Since it's buffering, I just want you to take account of how many times you are told that it's safe. How many times you're told that it's Six safe. blocks away. The neighborhood is safe. It's very comfortable living here. There's definitely something here for everyone. When I show this property, uh, many people react really positively about the updates and the renovations. We're really proud of all the improvements that we've put in building recently. We have Caesar stone countertops, designer stainless steel appliances, recessed lighting, new hardwood floors, new fixtures in the bathrooms, new tiling, a central HVAC. Full-time super and elevator. Security cameras all over the building. We've been coming into the building. It's very nice. It's definitely a comfortable living standard for anyone. The location itself, great. You're close to a museum. It's about not, one block. Literally one not. block from the train. There's also two buses that cross right in front of the building. It's very, very convenient. There's stores nearby and many restaurants. The neighborhood definitely has a lot to offer. It's good stuff. It's a great location. I like the community. People who live here are very easygoing. The neighborhood is safe. Building is safe. And they're able to get something that matches their budget. You know, they get really great value, they're getting updated apartments, they're getting great spaces, and they're getting great location. And you know, when you're in New York City, you get all three of those, that's exactly what you're looking for. The East Harlem explosion occurred in March. When that explosion occurred, I thought that it was this property. And I thought it was this property because in 2011 there was an explosion that actually affected some of the rent control units and one of the elderly women that you saw on the sofa was actually pushed out of her apartment. Um, she lived, you know, when you have apartments that are in rent control, rent stabilized uh, uh, settings, um, you know, the landlords don't really have a ton of incentive to, to uh, upkeep them and the landlords didn't want to make the repairs even though he was legally obligated and um, essentially offered her a pretty minuscule buyout that she really didn't have the power to refuse uh, because she didn't have anywhere else, she didn't have any other option. Um, when the East Trauma explosion occurred, I thought it was this building, right? And, and, and it was actually across the street. This building moved a couple inches when that explosion occurred. All of the windows were blown out on that side of the building and they've yet to be repaired. So like even as if I wanted to go search right now, I was like, oh, that sounds good, maybe I'll call. Half of the windows of this apartment complex are still blown out and apartments are going for like 2000 to $3,000 a month. Um, so short clip after this and, and that, that'll be all. Um, but I, as I begin to take this film across the city, and see how this was affecting, I don't know, I'm bad at multitasking, give me two seconds.
can't. I can't multitask. I've never been able to. Okay. So as I began to uh, go across, I remember San Diego was the first time that I'd ever actually seen another community through this perspective, right? Like I visited other like, friends and stuff, but like uh, the film got into the San Diego Latino you know, Film Festival and community, a whole bunch of community members actually from Barrio Logan came out to the screen, like 60. And at first they were kind of disappointed because they thought the film was about their barrio, El Barrio. They call it, it's, it's a group of Mex, it's a community of Mexicans, but basically same thing. Highway destroyed the community, uh, public and private sector disinvested, city put all the, the uses any community tends to not want, put them there. Um, disinvestigated the no opportunity, but now, oh wait, it's 15 minutes from the center of the city, and now it's important again, but the people aren't. So they're going to do the same thing. And we were, we were kind of talking about, oh, like different things that they tried and maybe failed, or we tried and maybe failed to mitigate or deal with this issue in our communities. And what was amazing was that we were kind of just like reinventing the wheel. Like, we'd all been through similar stages, we just weren't communicating, or we weren't connected. And so we realized from that point that there was a real need, because um, there had been a lot of films um, on individual communities. I just finished doing one. I hadn't, I mean, in terms of an entire cities, that's a huge, it's a huge piece to take off. I don't know why, but we thought it would be a good idea to try and uh, talk about this issue uh, nationally. Um, displacement and, and really, you know, who really does have the actual right to remain in, in the communities um, that they're in. And so, We've been on a 15-city tour all across the, the, the country. We're about halfway through now. Um, just trying to learn right now and see, okay, well, how, how is this happening? Is there a national narrative here? Um, and if so, what is that? And um, because, again, these policies are federal, and, and, the, and the market forces that are affecting our communities are global. And a lot of these investors and developers, they're, they're global. And they communicate with each other. And so this is about trying to make sure our communities are doing the same thing. Um, and so I'll, I'll play this for you. The last thing I want to say, just watching all of the, if I've been a little all over the place in my presentation, it's been because as I was watching King talk about the projects there, and as I, I came across his work when I was researching um, the public housing specific portion of mine, and um, it, it's, I don't know, I'd like to hear what you think about it, but to, like, has anyone ever just watched videos of these buildings being imploded? Has anyone ever watched videos of, of public housing complexes in America being like dynamited to the ground? Yeah. You've watched that? Yeah. Dynamited. Why dynamited? Because they were built in the 50s and the 60s. What were we doing? Cold War. So they were built with the intention to last through nuclear bombs. I wouldn't test it. But that's why they needed so much dynamite. And it just seems so violent. And so as we're having this conversation, I'm sorry that I've been all over the place. I'm sure I'm over time and I apologize. But it is, it's emotional because that's violent. And I think that going forward, not only are we trying to learn how this has affected this, this has affected other communities and what other communities are doing, but also try and see, you know, how how we can in some way come to cope um, with that. Um, that that woman in, in our, I'm gonna we'll talk in the conversation. I just want to play this. This is for our nationwide tour. And if you would like to support, we definitely do need the support. We're really just. Um, at the beginning of understanding how this process is working across the country, and we love all sorts of collaboration and input and donations. <laughs>
a 500 year displacement. We've shown that we are resilient people. Again, to King and Andrew, can we give it up for them for just <laughs> for creating work, for documenting, for bringing analysis, power, insight, and holding a space for a conversation that doesn't get to happen enough, right? So I have a couple things to say that are just like totally from my beating heart, and then I'll talk a little more boring about Austin. Um, so, um, for me, what is so striking and so incredible about the work of King and Andrew is that it reminds us that residents are definitely, are the soul and the mandate of government. And so, whatever is your political science theory or political philosophy, you've got to remember that government, particularly local government, as a mandate and kind of hold space for residents and to think about what that means for place as well. And so the work, both of their projects really lift up how important it is to, to hear, to kind of stop, to listen to the voices that analyze and live in these cities and in these places that are under intense economic pressure. Um, and not just to hear, but to respond. So the documentation effort is really important. I think I was saying this to you, Clinton, about film as a medium for, for documenting, for advocacy, for organizing, and, and how powerful it is, um, not just for the general public, but for, for policymakers, for government leaders to kind of look at this and think about what does this, what does this mean as a call to action. Um, and to also remind us that residents represent um, our stewards, our planners, our, our analysts, um, as fancy or fancier than the people in this room, right? So it's not necessarily just, it's not going to be your education or technical training that are always going to give you the best insight, but it's the lived experience. And certainly filmmakers like King and Andrew remind us of how important it is to remember that and hold space. So that is just straight from, um, from the heart, for sure. Um, really appreciating King's uh, attempt to disrupt the idea that concentrated poverty is a thing um, unto itself. Kind of what does it mean to think about public housing um, and the policy in Atlanta, which is to, to really think about concentrated poverty and how do, we, how do we rethink that and does that mean demolishing public housing? Um, and, I don't, I'm, and King doesn't seem to think so and I don't either. Right? There's a bigger, there's a more complex answer and question that he's pulling us into. Um, and for Andrew's work, also thinking about just the question of, of land, again, and how do people hold land, not just for uh, a year or a generation, but for multiple generations moving across land or being displaced. And so that's the other theme that's here, so displacement across land, how do people hold that? For King as well, this other question about self-determination. And so what is the space for self-determination in urban revitalization? and urban places being remade. And so this is definitely a way that this work kind of links back to some of the work that I do now in the city as Boston sits um, in this incredible moment of economic boom and explosion. Uh, the, the income inequality rate in Boston right now is expanding at an unbelievable rate. Um, by many accounts, it's the fastest gentrifying city in the United States right now. Gentrifying faster than New York. Atlanta, in LA, um, all these places, um, Boston is swinging very hard. And so what does that mean to sit in a city um, that has about, right now, I think there's $6.5 billion in the ground, um, 13 million square feet of new office space, residential space being populated right at this moment, 
earlier today, I was on a on the top of a ladder on the Millennial Tower, uh, in, which is in the uh, um, in the old Filings Basement Hole. Um, it's going to be the largest, the tallest resident tower in Boston. It's a penthouse crazy. for thirty-seven point five million dollars. It's a penthouse in the apartment. That's true. That's just one of the floors, right? So. What does this mean in real terms, right? Are these things to celebrate? Or are there things to kind of give us pause, particularly if we're having a conversation about gentrification? Um, what's interesting is that uh, th that is the, the opportunity to think about policy in this conversation becomes really important. And so, um, as you all know, very you know, well know in this, in this room, we have a new mayor in Boston. And so, uh, Mayor Walsh has been really clear about running on um, an agenda that's about um, equity and access. And what does it mean if we think about cities as a, um, way to think about cities as uh, a portal for distribution? Money is coming into a city or capital is coming into a city. We know that, that we're in a, market, a free market economy, whatever that means. It's nothing. A capitalist economy, call it what it is. We know that the way that that works is by segmenting um, people that don't have and people that have very starkly. And so, what could it mean to disrupt that kind of distribution mechanism, which is the default? So, from a policy standpoint, that means that when a building is built in Boston, when it's over 100,000 square feet, right, we try to we apply a policy called linkage. And so that there's money that comes off of a property that goes right into a housing trust, um, a jobs trust, and that goes to residents. Um, what is that enough? Right now, no. Linkage is a policy I'm looking at, but is an example I offer to think about ways that cities can really think about moments of prosperity um, and how to reset um, some of the default of that. The default being a very wide income disparity, a very wide uh, wealth disparity, and a problematic around housing and displacement. So the mayor has also just now announced a new housing plan, which, which plans to bring 53,000 new units of housing to Boston. Um, that's great. Yeah, what's the question? The question is, how do we finance that? The question is, uh, how do we make sure that the, the housing stock that the city has right now um, for low income families, affordable housing stock is maintained and grown. So I also am a product of public housing. Um, my family came from West Virginia to Boston, grew up in public housing in Dorchester. I know how important that housing stock is to preserving um, a place to be, to live, to remain in the cities for families that are, um, that are working, for families that are not. So one of the questions that I would roll back to for us is to think about what what is the role of, of government in a real aggressive and kind of robust way of thinking or rethinking what policy looks like for place making. It's not just a housing question. There has to be a job consideration in that too. Um, and how, what do we have to say about public housing? Um, and how and public housing and also public transportation, all these things that allow cities to be, uh, to be affordable to be livable, to be inclusive of all the people that live in them. So um, these are things that just, that are simpler, that are harder to address than just kind of one sure, um, one certain policy. Because a lot of the things that we're talking about are the result of failed policies. Right? It's not about failed people in these communities for sure, certainly not the folks that you guys are interviewing and documenting, but thinking about what is the, uh, what is the vision? I think you asked both asked this so beautifully. Like, what is the vision for cities, um, cities going forward to make sure that the people who live in cities are the people that get to be in cities for a long time? Folks that have already been there, long-term populations. Um, so I'll stop there. I could definitely um, go on, but I would say that for me, as someone that has the opportunity to think about um, longer durations of time. Um, because that's my training as a historian, I do think about 50 or 70 years or kind of multiple generations at once, um, which made me wonder why the mayor would actually want to hire me for this job because <laughs> um, it's sort of an unusual disposition. Um, but also that that is the only way that we can get to sustainability in a city. I would say by foregrounding what residents, current residents' lived experience is, 
by thinking of over a much longer time horizon and understanding that multiple kind of policy measures that are ad addressing these for me, land use, um, capital investment, and workforce development, all those things coming together um, and trying to be aggressive about it at a time when there is there are more there are more dollars on the table. Um, that's certainly true for Boston. Um, and uh, we try to deal with that but despite the fact that we have um, so many uh, folks in our city, so many institutions that are tax free. Um, so I won't say anything about where I'm sitting, um, but I will say that it uh, makes it interesting for us to think about payment and bill of tax payments, right? And how folks help us to make the city work. So, um, but all these things are really important for just trying to get at questions that are not easily easily solved. So um, I guess I can do that. But I'm um, really look forward to hearing more from what you guys have to say in the room of questions. Great, thank you. Yeah. mics up with you but we should be able to hear you clearly but if you can project as best as you can and um, I'll just call on on you to ask questions of King Andrew or Carolyn. Could I just request that when people if you could just say your name, age and where you're where name hey. not age. Not age. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. I apologize. Not your age, not your age, not your age. Not your age. Your name? Where you live now and where you're from. Where you're from, where you live now. <clears throat> Name. Great. I just want to call. I, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and my father served in the Korean War. Okay. Uh, my parents are from Puerto Rico. Um, we moved out when I was 10 years old. Um, there were seven kids. And I said, you know, I don't want to move. This is my home. And they said, well, it's getting bad in the city. I was in Brooklyn, New York. Never got beat up. Everybody got along with each other. I had black friends, Hispanics, Jewish friends. It was a, a, it was a, a melting pot of, of immigrants. And they said, no, we have to move. It's getting bad. But mom, I didn't get beat up or nothing happened. What's wrong? They moved us to Connecticut. I got beat up. All the time. Field hockey was, I hated the gym because I knew when I got in the field I would get beat up by the sticks, by the, all the white girls, because they didn't know. Um, my dad, he tried to get housing in Brooklyn, and I felt very, my, my heart was broken for him because he was very humble. He worked in a thread shop feeding nine people under $100, okay? Um, he tried to apply for housing, he didn't get it. Um, so I just wanted to say, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very tragic for, um, for people of low income. And um, they, they could figure out ways naturally to help each other. Um, uh, you know, they, they rely on kin, you know, their, their uh, neighbors for things that they can't get. You know, if they're not working or food or, or things like that. So I just I just wanted to point that out. Great, thank you. Yes. Um, my name is Lisa and I'm 21. <laughs> 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 some very uncomfortable conversations to really talk about this and I think people don't really feel comfortable talking about lack of equal education, lack of opportunity, drug, gang violence, mental illness, all of those things I think are really important parts of the solution. Um, but my question is what are the concrete steps that we really need to take because gov I see government as helping to perpetuate this problem. So the example I'm thinking of is on my block. I live downtown DC, and there's one more public housing building within maybe a five mile radius. The government has sold it to a developer. That could not have happened if the government had not agreed. And sure, they, there's a regulation that says X percentage of the units have to be sold to people who are from low, but that's not gonna get it done. 
So what really needs to happen so we can stop having this circuitous conversation and really change the game? I would say even in D.C., even in D.C., probably you know that landscape better than anyone, right? So sort of what is that grassroots kind of coalition of folks that have been pushing? Because even here in Boston, kind of the worst policy has been set. I mean, the West End is a classic example, right? The government comes in and kind of blows out an entire neighborhood, 2,000 people out the door. New York Street's the same thing. That was government policy, right? And, but there's a change that was exacted there was because of grassroots coalitions forcing it. So no good policy ever comes out the door from government alone. There's no benevolence that would never even sign on to that. No matter what is the what is the what is the pressure on the ground and how can that be leveraged to exact something, not to make it seem overly simplistic, but I feel like when I think about the best policy, the best progressive action, it's always out of City Hall. Um, and the question is how does that then kind of pressure I mean, the, boy, the folks here in the, in the, in the assembly as well are organizing, right? They're folks who are organizing brought legal action that certainly one lever. Um, <coughs> but then, kind of what is the role of standing with folks who are actually putting the pressure? Um, it's always the best solution that are coming there. Okay. Um, I can speak directly to what I know about okay. Atlanta. Oh, do I need to talk in here? All right. Well, I can speak directly to what I know of Atlanta in the sense that we have a 20% rule as well. Um, our mayor now, Kasim Reed, for you know, for all he's been known for, particularly the snow apocalypse disasters. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, it was awful. But the one thing he has been really good at is about not just making sure that residents who are long-term residents who want to be a part of Atlanta stay a part of Atlanta. 20% of all new residents and new redevelopment in Atlanta has to be deemed affordable. The great thing that at least what I've seen in Atlanta, at least now with this particular mayor versus the last 20 years or so, is that in addition to being 20%, all residents who live in Atlanta pay their property taxes for at least five to 10 years, as well as doctors, um, teachers, firemen, policemen, school teachers and, um, on the collegiate and the pre-K to the 12 level who all have basic tax freezes with a sense that as long as you live and work in Atlanta, you work for Atlanta city government, or if your family does as well, you take a certain percentage of your taxes and you freeze it. And in the case of someone who is elderly as well, for those particular um, with property taxes, as well as the ability for them to go further on late rent payments. So it's really hard to move them out. But again, this is one mayor who's coming after, you know, 20 years of so-so policy and things that have happened on a political level, as well as just in the open market that mayors couldn't handle. So Atlanta's trying to get it together. We can't seem to get a plow on the street, but at least we can keep people in their house. Is Right to the City organizing in D.C.? I'm sorry, what? Right to the City, is that coalition in D.C.? They're, uh, they're in the Bay Area and they're also in Boston. I think they do some work in Chicago, too. No, but I, I don't think there's a groundswell of people who are, who are lobbying the city. You hear conversations like this, but what I'm talking about is there needs to be some massive effort to say, we are going to protect this. So instead of selling it to a developer, why doesn't the city develop it for to keep people there and then provide these other opportunities so they can stay? That's what I'm talking about. Well, that's because the because the public sector just doesn't do that anymore. Like that's 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 that was um that was a thing. There was I was speaking to people because Bill De Blasio right now has his plan right of two hundred thousand. Who here has heard that Bill De Blasio is very liberal? Raise your hand. Okay. Did you read that Huffington Post article where he was like smashing liberals across the country? Like, you need a backbone. Did you read that? That was like on my newsfeed. It was crazy. In that plan, right, the plan is essentially what? In his affordable housing plan. The plan is to do what we can to incentivize the private sector to build more and hope that we get a small percentage, a larger percentage, excuse me, than before of that new housing. That's the goal, right? So um, mandatory inclusionary zoning for some, but right, but like in other areas that haven't been as gentrified as much, right? More more tax breaks there, more subsidies there to encourage building. So I mean I think that, that is that's the core problem that we have 
right now. If you are going to the scene of a fire and you see that the thing's on fire, you probably would want to know where the gas or what's fueling that fire. In New York, we're not asking what's fueling the speculative housing market. What we're instead doing is doing what we can to, to, to oh, maybe we'll try a different fuel, or maybe we'll try less fuel here and more fuel there. You're still putting fuel on the fire. The, thing, the thing's burning. And so I, I think that it goes back to, as, as, was, as was just said, it goes back to land. And, and the problem is our, our policies are focused on developing the value of land. And that really only works if you own land. And enough to pay, right, the increasing property tax as your land gets more expensive. So, I mean, I can't tell you there's a specific prescription to solve gentrification. If I had that, I maybe wouldn't be so pissed. Um, but I think that, you know, you need to get organized. I think that we need to um, focus not necessarily on individual politicians, because they're dealing with forces that are much larger than them, right? In, in New York, the biggest donator to our political campaigns is the Real Estate Board of New York. So why do you think our policy is the way it is, right? I think that we need to... We need to get organized, we need to get active, and understand that our assets are our biggest asset. For New York City public housing residents, that's the biggest thing we got right there. We're still there. Public housing is still there. That's pretty damn good. That is one of the biggest assets. The other thing is, is I, I think that we need to just begin to have, we need to have these conversations, not about specific politicians, but trying to understand structural power. One of the most painful things is when I hear people in community meetings, and I just, and, and we heard it in, in the clip from from the Atlanta way, talking about the plan. You know, the New York Times will come into my community and ones like it and take quotes from residents and say, oh, you know, you know, a quote where residents like, they have a plan to kick us all out. And the people of the New York Times are like, these paranoid, um, ignorant people, they, uh, you don't know what they're talking about. And the sad thing is, we might not have, like, the, 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 the language of urban planning or whatever, but I didn't, like, I, finding out urban planning was a profession happened when I was an adult, right? But that isn't because I wasn't smart. That's because you, certain people have access to structural power and the knowledge that comes with that, and some people don't. So I think that going forward, our, we have to really focus on, on, on structural analyses and not this percentage of that and the other thing, because what we're doing in New York is not a model to follow across the nation. Let me be the first to say that. I'm not the first. Let me be the first one here tonight to say that. There have been many who have been saying that. Um, what we're doing in New York is we're, we're just trying to grease the wheel and hoping it goes in a different direction. But we're not changing the driver, and we're not stopping the car. So, um, yeah. Um, so uh, thanks so much for coming here and sharing your um, documentaries and experiences with us. I wanted to ask about the question of mixed income housing that you that you seem to suggest was a positive, um, or at least partially a positive solution in, in Atlanta. In New York, what these sort of build like development properties that have to have a, like a certain percentage of, of um, mixed income or lower income housing um, apartments. Um, though they, that, that led to the phenomenon of the poor doors, um, which if you live in New York, you've, you've heard about, which is like, sure, you have this big fancy building and a certain amount of the units have to be uh, for lower income and, and middle income residents, but they have a separate entrance, they have a certain, in other words, there, there's sort of still the stratification um, and inequality in, um, in, at least in the way that it's been implemented in New York, this mixed income model. Um, so sort of, does it work differently in other, in other cities, in Boston or in Atlanta, um, that you know of? Like, is there an inclusion, an inc inclusive solution um, to, this, to this problem that we're, that we're talking about here tonight? Um, speaking directly about Atlanta, the way that makes one, we don't have that many high rises, so it's a little different. In the sense that with Atlanta, either they're typically through apartments or townhomes or row homes, as you guys have seen in Baltimore and things like that. But once you, unless you are actually talking to a direct realtor, the other residents do not know who has what income. And so for Atlanta, it's been a very success in that regard, in the sense that someone who only makes 15000 a year could be living next door to someone who makes 200000 but the binding glue is that both residents have the same standards of upkeep. So a lot of times in Atlanta, what happens is, at least with people in public housing, they keep a higher level of standard because they were used to that in public housing. So 
you know, keeping lawns clean, keeping things mowed and things like that, things they weren't necessarily originally known for doing, they keep a higher standard, so they actually keep the property values going up. So Atlanta is a little different, but I can't speak on Boston or New York. I would just, um, so in Boston, we, we, the approach, at least by the Boston Housing Authority, has been to maintain a lot of the, how the, the low-income housing stock, although there has been some, um, uh, what would you say, turnovers through Hope 6 investments, or so you do have some mixed income models. What makes the Boston market sort of interesting as well is that folks through organizing and activist work have pushed more into kind of cooperative or shared ownership models for housing, which is something we haven't talked about tonight. But it's interesting to me that even in uh, the Catherine Barr and the early women reformers that kind of give us public housing policy in 1934-37, that there was lots of competition even in the 30s about shared models, shared ownership models for public housing, and that's kind of fallen off the table. And even in the 60s, when that kind of came back into play, when the federal government released some money to experiment with the idea of tenant-managed housing, um, it, it was something that folks didn't really exploit. And now it's like this conversation has gone back, come back around since we talked more about the sharing economy with that, whatever that really even means, right? So um, that language, the idea that there's more space in conversation is something that um, is also important in the housing space. And I know you guys know that space from conversations about Uber, Airbnb, um, also conversations around uh, urban agriculture, land banking, land trust is something I'm looking at from a community perspective as well. So a, a lot of words basically just to say that I feel like there, there needs to be more conversation about the cooperative strategies for thinking about housing development. And, and there are some amazing models in New York, maybe some in Atlanta too, I'm not sure, but that's another space to think about what is it, how do you hold on to um, housing stock that's affordable when the direction is going elsewhere, We're going toward luxury. Uh, the, the buildings that are in the ground right now in Boston, 8% of them toward luxury housing. This is nothing for middle income, for rural income is just not even, you know, it's a different conversation. So it's a great question. Maybe just a last question. The last one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Hi, I'm Rael. I'm originally from Boston, but I attended Georgia State University as well. And my question from also kind of like a government perspective, because I work in constituent services, is when you're moving these families out of housing and you're only allowing 20% to come back, where are these other people going? Because, for instance, today I'm speaking to a lady who is now ho homeless because she was kicked out of her housing, and she has a five-year-old, and it's like, you're trying to find community resources, but what do you do as a whole when only 20% of people can come back, and we already know that the wait lists are years behind and everything else is you know, not happening as far as affordable housing for these families. Um, with regards to Atlanta, and the one thing that we will explore in the film is what happens to people who didn't get public housing. And unfortunately for a lot of people, we don't know. But of the people we did find, and then unfortunately also through police reports, those who weren't able to find housing eventually did things that we assume people would do, which is rob and steal. There weren't things, instances of necessarily violence for that reason, but one thing we noticed is that after public housing projects went down, violent property, particularly grand larceny and petty larceny, if you guys know what those are, increased because people essentially looking for cars, they're looking for any place that they can see or stay in for the night, as well as the number of homeless shelters with full occupancy increased in Atlanta. But that's only what I can speak on with what we know of the residents who were able to at least still be tracked. And let's be for real about it. Again, housing is only a piece of it, right? And the, the, the importance of, 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 of affordable housing is thinking about the subsidy piece. So how do you want to subsidize housing? That's a question. And then the other question is, like, how do you create better jobs or expand the job market so folks can have more income? So that's another piece of it. So it can never be this kind of one part strategy. It would never shirk government's responsibility in that. But it, it has been a very herky-jerky relationship between the federal government uh, states and local governments which say who wants to hold their hand in the, in the, in the affordable housing mix and everyone is saying me, no, not me, you, you, and it's a mess, right? And so then we're having this huge blow up right now in terms of the homelessness of the unhoused population in Boston because of the Long Island Bridge breakdown, but then um, it, it goes back to a bigger question around opportunity 
economic inclusion in a city that can, it cannot just be a housing conversation. It needs to be, but it cannot be that in isolation. Um, and I feel like uh, there, there's got to be HUD needs to, I don't know, there's an opportunity for leadership there, not just financially, but also just in terms of the conversation. And it's bigger than promise zones, and it's bigger than choice neighborhoods. And so it can go off on that another time. But well, is there a way just to say one thing before? Sure. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. In a minute, going back to mixed income communities in New York, that really has not been a good, uh, it's been problematic. It's been problematic because you're, you're, you're subsidizing uh, mixed income communities, right? In poor communities. And there's this idea that by bringing in wealthy people through osmosis, poor people become wealthier. Right? Just imagine, it's like you rub off on me and all of a sudden I, I, my income starts going up. And so I think we want mixed income communities. We want to make sure that our community's income is going up and that that's why we have a mixed income community. Not that we're bringing in people from outside and now we have a mixed income community. Um, because it only remains mixed in that interim period, right? While the poor are leaving and the wealthy are coming in because then eventually it becomes an upper an upper income community, right? And, and so on and so forth. And that's what's happened um, in New York. Um, I Just in terms of things we can do, it's very important. The last thing I'll say, if, if you really want to work towards changing what's, what's happening, um, obviously organizing, obviously thinking about this in terms of structural power, but also we're, we're subsidizing this, all of you. What do we do? Everyone here pays for this. In New York, a uh, billion dollars was spent in 2013 subsidizing luxury developments. Through one tax break, right? So in terms of where are we going to subsidize? Oh, well, the government doesn't build public housing anymore. Well, it's, it's not, the government doesn't build housing anymore, but it subsidizes, right? So we're gonna, if public assistance is fine for developers, and public assistance is fine um, for those with more structural power, why is it that we're supposed to be self-reliant? Right? We're supposed to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps. But there are others that we're giving a lot of subsidies and a lot of support to. So I think that we just need to be clear about that. And thank you, everybody.